I'm uh, Bob Borens, the director of the Freeburg Economics Institute. We're very pleased to host with Gold Money what we hope will be a very interesting evening for everyone. Freeburg Economics Institute was founded in 2014 with the goal of raising awareness in Israel about the nature and benefits of economic freedom. We do two seminars per year in which we invite participation from Israeli university students and we bring the best lecturers from around the world to teach on this subject. Take a moment to uh, thank uh, Dov and Nancy Freeberg who are here, who make the Freeberg Economic Institute possible. So please. <laughs> Our subject tonight is money, something I believe that interests everyone. We'd like to challenge assumptions about money that, may, that most take for granted. One is that governments need or should be in charge of controlling and managing our money. We'd also like to take a look at how technology is impacting the world of money and payment systems, and whether there is a prospect of the, quote, uberization of money. That is, we'd like to ask if new technological tools can actually undermine the current monetary establishment and status quo and create a new reality regarding monetary management and payment systems. In beginning to think about this, I'd just like to throw out two pieces of data. First, since the United States de-linked to gold in 1971 and allowed the dollar to float freely, it is worth today 16% of what it was worth in purchasing power in 1971. Second, the volume of global currency trading today amounts to over $5 trillion daily, 73 times greater than all trade in goods and services. So it's something to think about. We're very honored to have a very distinguished group of speakers with us tonight. Professor uh, Mario Blecher, Vice Chairman of Banco, how do you say it? Hipotecario. 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 Professor Blecher is the former governor of the Central Bank of Argentina. And for those that follow the news in Israel, know that Professor Blecher was one of the names floated as a possible replacement for Stanley Fisher as the head of the Bank of Israel several years ago. Dr. Yoav Intrader is chief technology officer of Bank of Polim. Prior to joining Bank of Polim, he was general manager and principal program manager with Microsoft in Ribbon, Washington. Roy Seabag is chief executive officer and founder of Gold Money. He is Israeli by birth, right? Yes, I'm guilt. Okay. <laughs> and he has extensive background in the investment business. And Josh Crum is chief strategy officer of Gold Money and co-founder of the company. Previously, he was executive director and senior metal strategist at Goldman Sachs. The program is two hours. In the first hour, each presenter will speak for 20 minutes. We'll then have a half hour discussion between presenters and then open for questions from the audience. So please note your questions and then save them for the Q&A session. With no further ado, allow me to introduce Professor Blecher, who will speak on the subject, can we rely on governments to provide stable currencies? When I was asked uh, to participate in this, uh, in this meeting, uh, I was given some uh, guidelines about the, the, the subject I, I want, that they want me to cover. Uh, basically, the question that was posed there was, uh, uh, can the central banks really produce all the traditional, conventional amount of money that, uh, that would be needed with the growth of the, economy, the world economy, or, or they will really have to, will be a need, not only a, it will happen, but will be a need for alternative alternative monetary means. So the, that that was the question that I basically took as guiding guiding principle. Uh, now uh, I, I like to discuss a number of issues related to central banks and try to to answer this question. But uh, also, uh, in, 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 during this discussion, I'd, I'd like to discuss also the, the concept of money, or what we really uh, believe is, uh, is behind the, this, this issue of money, that uh, very recently, very recently, 
uh, the, the former governor of the Central Bank of England, uh, the Bank of England, Mervyn King, a very distinguished uh, central banker and uh, economic uh, theoretician, called it uh, that money is some sort of alchemy. Uh, the, the way that, the, the same way that, uh, you know, the, the, it was believed that you can do some tricks and, and get uh, gold from other metals, you, you make some tricks and you, you get money out of paper. And uh, he explained that uh, the, the same way that alchemy uh, did not really work, uh, uh, this uh, fractional fractional monetary system in which uh, the banks create money from nothing, uh, basically is not going to to be able to hold over time. And that, that's the reason for the crisis. That is his uh, pr pr proposition. But that, that is an extreme view of, of money. I, uh, I think that the... What we know from what we can say at the current current state of affairs, basically the question that I was posed is, has a very uh, complicated answer because at a, at a very, very basic level, it has a very simple answer, but it's more complicated. The, the very basic level is the question is if there is a, if central banks can provide all the monetary assets that are demanded, yes, of course, they can, in principle, technically, they could print all the money they want. In general, central banks can print all the money they want, but the, the question is, if this will continue to be money, if, if uh, there is too much money in the system. Because the reason why you, some instrument uh, become uh, money is because of the credibility or the confidence uh, that the public could have or hold on those, uh, based on those that uh, issue this money. That, that is the key issue. Even when gold was uh, in, the, in the past, uh, and maybe will be in the future, uh, a monetary, a very key monetary asset, was confidence and credibility what was behind this. Um, now, um, what make a, a currency, uh, or what make the, the institution of the central bank credible? So whatever they print, or the, whatever they produce is considered a monetary asset. Uh, first of all, uh, well, there's a discussion about that, but first of all, one can say that they have a government guarantee. They, got, they have a government guarantee that uh, whatever they, they do, uh, it is backed by a certain government behavior, particularly the fiscal side, that will keep certain degree of uh, of stability because money is a nominal asset and stability is the key. Um, in 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 essence, however, uh, the the actual way to, to demonstrate that the government gives a guarantee or believe in this asset is something that is very interesting. My grandson told me yesterday that the, the, the rabbi uh, Moshe Feinstein in New York uh, defined money in a way that is uh, very much the, 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 the way that was a more modernly or more, more recently was defined as a key question, issue to define money. So the, the way the government provides this guarantee that is behind the monetary operation of the central bank is if the government will accept that asset to, uh, as, pe as a payment for taxes. That's what Moshe Feinstein said that, and basically it's actually the, the way to, to define. It's a very good way of defining. Um, just as a, an aside, when uh, I happened to be in, in Argentina, the governor of the central bank, we, it was a very, very difficult period. It was, uh, was a major crisis of Argentina's history. And uh, during that period, uh, the provinces, the, uh, equivalent to the states in the United States, the provinces started issuing their own their own currency, but it was not their own currency. There was, there were papers that they pay salaries with them because they didn't have money, they didn't have a, a currency, so they were paying salaries with uh, IOUs, with uh, obligation, uh, with little bonds that started circulating. Now the Constitution of Argentina says that the the only one that can issue money is um, the central bank. So we went to the Supreme Court and tried to stop the states from issuing these uh, these assets. And the, the point was that uh, uh, the way that the Supreme Court uh, pro prohibited, limited the provinces from issuing money was that it forbid, it, it, it actually barred 
the provinces from accepting these own papers as payment for taxes. You, you can pay the, the salaries if you want, but you cannot accept this as payment for taxes. And that actually derailed the whole thing. This, this little IOUs disappear. Uh, so that is uh, one of the, the issues. If it, it can be accepted for payment of, of, of taxes. Uh, now, the, if, the, if this guarantee exists, the central banks can provide as, mu as much currency as they want. However, it's not really true. Not as much as they want. They can print all what they want. But in order for this to continue to be money, it has to have some way of preserving the value. And if there is a lot of inflation in the system, if uh, the, the nominal value uh, is maintained, but the real value of, the, of this uh, asset that the central bank provides, it goes down, people stop accepting it, as well. stop looking at this as money, and they start using foreign exchange, other currencies, and we will discuss later on here too. Uh, so it's not, it's, you need to have a good reputation that you are not going to produce high inflation, and you have to have a government guarantee in order to be able to produce, to produce money. What you also may need, but here there is a confusion, in, and in my view is a confusion, is reserves. The central banks, there is a view in the public that it comes from history, comes from the gold standard or whatever, that currencies need, in my view, I think it's not a correct view, but that, that, that currencies, countries need reserves in order to back their currency. The currency has to be backed in some way. You are, you, you see a lot this expression, this central bank is printing money well without backing. The backing for a central bank is the confidence that people have in, in the way that the government is going to, the government is going to honor their, their obligations and the, with the central bank and the, the, there will be certain stability in the value. Current reserves, well, yes, you may have some reserves as a, as a way of backing the currency if you want, but that is not, you could have a complete and absolute currency which is completely accepted, completely stable, completely credible without any backing. This backing, the issue that you need backing to, to uh, have a currency, is uh, it comes from uh, basically from, um, from, from long time ago when the, the, the gold standard was in use. Now. On the other hand, this is true for central bank money. You have the government backing, you don't need any, any real backing. I, this is not true for the private sector, however. If the private sector uh, will issue, as we will be discussing here, uh, it will issue something that is reasonably regarded as, as a monetary asset, it needs some, some if, if, uh, I would say, concrete asset to, to back it in some way. Because the confidence in the private sector does not come from a promise of a government that has all the ability to tax and all the ability to conduct a monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, so, for example, global firms can issue uh, their, this, uh, uh, this monetary instrument if they have a reputation and they do have a large number of outlets or a large number of production of, of the commodity, however, that they, they, they may be selling. They may need to have a backing. But that's a very big difference between the, the commercial money, if you want to call it this way, and official central bank money. Now, uh, will, con will be the central banks going to maintain the credi their credibility and their, their confidence? That is a question, not how much they can make the printing press work, but how much they can comp continue to to, um, okay, to to keep their credibility, to keep their confidence. Well, I think that the, um, uh, what has happened after the after the um, crisis of 2008 is is very remarkable. It's, it's a very remarkable situation. The behavior of central banks have been different, and as a consequence. Today we could have a doubt about the ability of central banks to conserve, or to preserve their uh, credibility. The, we are living now through a very, very particular monetary history period. I really think it's a historic period. Uh, we have a very unusual combination of factors. 
We have a large amount of liquidity, huge amount of liquidity. This, I, 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 sorry, I didn't bring these pictures. If you look at the balance sheets of central banks that represent the liquidity in the system are unbelievable. Uh, the jumps in all the major central bank liquidity. The liquidity is, is immense. And this, before this is transforming into, into money through the multiplier, this is monetary base. The, multi the multiplier has not grown very much because um, there is no too much demand for credit because there is a still recessive uh, recession environment. It's like um, the, the, the base is there. If the multiplier wakes up, we will have an explosion in, the, in, in, in monetary assets. But at this moment, even the monetary base the, has, has exploded. Uh, we have a risk of deflation that until very recently, the whole question of said for central banks was to preserve the to uh, preserve the value of the money but the, the idea wasn't to avoid inflation but the, we have a risk of deflation which all the economists agree that deflation is more complicated and more difficult to deal with than, than inflation and the most interesting thing is something that uh, uh, that we saw it cannot happen you know economies uh, economics is not like uh, hard science in which you have experiments and you discover new things. You discover something, you have a discovery, you have an invention. It's, no, this is a description of, of, of reality. But, but there is something that was discovered uh, recently. We thought that there is something that cannot exist. Re negative nominal interest rates cannot exist. There is a lower bound, there is a lot of uh, reasons. Because if, if what it means that you buy a bond from the government, and 10 years later, the government will pay you less than what you put in. That's, that's a negative. So we saw this doesn't exist. Nobody will buy it, I mean, obviously. Well, not that obvious, that we are going through this period of negative interest rates. Um, now, how we arrive here, and this is, well, I think time is short now. And how do we arrive here? Well, we are right here through a process in which uh, central banks started to have a um, uh, a very active role uh, in the second half of that century. And uh, they were in a roller coaster in terms of reputation. Now, you may remember that in 2006, those that remember 2006, 10 years ago only, uh, Greenspan, the, the, chair, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, retired, and he had the extremely high reputation. The maestro was called, uh, the teacher. Uh, the very high reputation, uh, one of the most the famous central bankers in history. He dealt very well with the 9-11 problem. He dealt very well with a number of recession, mini recessions in the United States, uh, with other crises. So he, he left in 2006, and his um, successor was uh, Ben Bernanke. And Bernanke said a, fra a phrase that probably is very sorry he said. He said, uh, on, uh, with the time of, with the pass of time, your reputation will grow. We, and it's true that the pass of time, his reputation grew, but in the opposite direction. Uh, like a year later, he was considered a, basically a failure because uh, either he was sleeping at the wheel, which is probably not the case, or he didn't see the global imbalances, he didn't see the asset price bubbles, they didn't see the subprime, they didn't see AIG, Lehman Brothers, all the story. So he was, I also think a, a little unfair, but he was completely blamed for everything. And the same with other central banks. With, uh, the Bank of England was very, very, I was at the Bank of England at the time. And uh, I remember, that I am Argentinian, I, uh, I, I, I saw what was happening in, uh, in Northern Rock, which is, uh, was a run on the bank. I went there and I sat there and I see people going, getting their money, going back to the, to the line, getting their money. I told Mary King, look, I have to give a rediscount and save this bank and because, you know, it's going to be a run. I said, no, we can't because uh, the EU doesn't allow us. I said, well, <laughs> EU, no EU, you're not going to, they know there's moral hazard. You know what, the EU is going to have a, a run. And he said, no, this is England. Uh, you know, you are, you are Argentinian. This is England. Nobody, uh, we don't have bank runs in England. Well, there were bank runs in England. Uh, so the, the, there was a problem there of uh, not rec rec recognizing or willing to recognize. 
the ECB was fighting unexistent inflation and there was no looking at anything. So the central bank really, really suffered reputational damage during the crisis of 2008. And the government turned around and said, well, somebody has to clean up this mess. I think the best candidate to clean up this mess is the, red, is the central bank. And so the central bank was charged to clean up the mess that they created, basically. And, um, and there, there is a book coming out now from uh, Ilarian, very famous observer of these things, and uh, it's called The Only Game on Time, in Town. The Only Game in Town. The Central Bank was the only game in town, just to create the, the, the crisis and to rescue. So they did very well. They solved the crisis that they created. They did very well. And now, again, the Central Banks are at the center of stage, because that, that's what they did. They responded in a, in a way that uh, I just described, a lot, uh, lot, uh, lot of liquidity. Of course, you put a nice name to it. You print a lot of money, and you call it quantitative easing. That's a very nice name. But that's what it is. There was a lot of money created. Uh, now, they, 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 at the same time, they gained back functions that they didn't have, or they had and they were taken away. All the, all the bank supervision went back to the central banks. 80% uh, of the uh, European banks are supervised by the ECB. The, the Bank of England got back the supervision. The, the, in America, they got this uh, Dodd-Frank Dodd uh, Act that really increased the power of, central, of the federal government and the financial system. Uh, so now the, the central banks have, true, have, 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 win, have won again uh, have a big reputation. But there are some worries, and that is the, 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 the bottom line of this, con this description. Uh, there are some problems. The, f the main problem, or worry, the main one, is the, the fact that um, the central banks are given also a lot of new functions, or they are taken a lot of new functions. Many of those have a lot of, of political implication. Central banks are affecting income distribution very much today, because low interest rates, affect the pension value of a lot of people. And uh, of course, that inflation also affects the pension value of a lot of people. But uh, here is more clear, it's more by design. Uh, so if they are taking a decision that affect income distribution, for example, those are political decisions. You have to, this is not a monetary decision, it's a political decision. And political decisions cannot be put in hand of people which are not voted for or not elected. Those are, uh, they have independence. So the, the independence of central banks is put in danger these days. It's in danger these days because of the fact that uh, central banks are doing a lot of things that they don't, do not require independence. Even theoretically, there is an issue called the timing consistent. The government, the monetary policy takes time to act. So governments try to, try to take some, say, some measures before elections because the monetary policy works in a certain way. And then after the election, they, they work in an opposite way. So uh, they, they, if you leave to government the, the action, they will do some, some perverse actions because of the incentive. So you better give it to an independent agent. But the income, this, uh, the, the current functions that the government is taking do not have this characteristic. But the most important thing is that what we are observing today, so I think that the, that the independence of the central bank is in doubt. But the most important thing, and I finish with this, is that um, there is a complete blur, a complete confusion between the limits of monetary policy on the one hand and fiscal policy on the other. Because this quantitative easing in general is based on the acquisition by the central bank of bonds of the central bank, of the gov central government. And the view is, well, the, you know, this is an open market operation. You buy a bond, but you don't buy a bond. You, you give money to the government, and the government gives you back a piece of paper. Now, this piece of paper has no value. Let's, let's be clear. E every place in the world, with one exception that I will mention, every place in the world is the same. It's not that the, I heard this in Israel and I heard this in Argentina all the time. Oh yes, in this, in this country, the central bank is full of paper from the from the government, but this, the government will not pay. Of course, the will, government will not pay. You imagine the the government of the United States, the Treasury, 
imposing an austerity program, uh, imposing taxes and cutting the expenditures to pay the Fed? Obviously not. This will not happen. So I think that there has to be a, a clear uh, view on this and basically eliminate it. I, I was mentioning that in Paris, every single year, I was invited one year to see that there's a ceremony in the central bank where they renew the bonds, the Napoleonic bonds, the bonds that Napoleon issued and sold to the Bank of France to, to be financed during their wars. So every year they renew them. I don't think they will be paid. Napoleon didn't pay them. I don't think anybody will pay them. So I think this is a very important problem at this moment, the way it is. So I, it looks to me that there is a, a, a threat to the central bank independence, uh, and there is a threat to the ability of the government to basically be the, the, the only the monopoly in the issuing of, of, of money. This is the current situation. I just thought that I will put it in this way. And there are many other uh, particular issues, but we may, we may be able to discuss them later. Thank you very much. Listening to you reminded me, I once heard a uh, famous uh, movie, movie mogul in Hollywood. He said, our business is to create dreams. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, it seems to be I can't tell the difference between uh, the, what the business of the central bank is and what the, cent the business of Hollywood is. Dr. Uh, Yuav Intrader, please speak on, is a blockchain truly a major disruptor in the financial industry? So I'm going to talk about uh, blockchain, and I uh, sort of wasn't sure. I was sort of assuming that most of the audience is a little bit uh, familiar with some of the technology. So I... Uh, one of, there's a major challenge in really explaining uh, blockchain, uh, and I'll explain it in a few seconds. Uh, but uh, for those that really want to have a quick understanding what it really means, uh, since most of you are already familiar with Bitcoin, indirectly you're familiar with blockchain because blockchain is the engine that enables the Bitcoin. Okay, so imagine some kind of an algorithm system that actually manipulates and really help people actually, I don't know, help or not, uh, actually trade in Bitcoin or buy Bitcoin or buy things through with Bitcoin and so on. I'll not get into the discussion, the philosophical discussion or physical discussion, is that the currency or not currency? In my opinion, it is, uh, but uh, we'll go, uh, we'll t maybe we'll talk about it later. How many of you recognize these things over here? Somebody recognize it? Yeah. Somebody does? Okay. Uh, if he didn't recognize it, my mom will tell him, go get a life. Uh, no offense. Uh, and I'll, you'll, you'll understand in a minute. Uh, but I'm joking. Okay. So the story behind it, one, uh, a few years ago, I'm a gadget collector. And I find this brochure or something like that. And I read the, I just look at this picture and I'm looking, wow, this is amazing hammer. And being a gadget collector, I said, I probably need five of those. I don't know what I'll do with it, but, you know, gadget collector, gadget collector, right? And I'm just like, where do I get this kind of a hammer? It's just fascinating. It has all of the characteristics almost a, of definitely a high-tech instrument. And I look further, and suddenly I fall into this website that actually describes a game, a virtual game. And this creature that eats human being and whatever it is, I don't know, I never really play him. Um, actually using this kind of a hammer. Um, so I said, oh wow, that, that's sort of a very disappointing in, in some respect. Uh, why I'm telling you this story? Because uh, similar, this hammer, we, we in the industry, many times we end up with sophisticated technology that falls in our hand and suddenly we're being asked, go use it. And trying to figure out, well, how do I use this hammer? There's a very sophisticated hammer and the hammer is this blockchain engine that somebody discovered, wait a minute, it's really good for the Bitcoin, maybe it's good for also other stuff beyond just Bitcoin. And this is exactly what we have. You have this sophisticated technology that you'll, I'll talk about a little bit in a few, few words, that we basically try to figure out how do we utilize it? Where are the opportunity to apply it? And today, just as a reference, in 2015, I'm saying 16, first quarter, we already, there is on the VCs already a $1.1 billion already invested in this technology, okay? 
So you're seeing a huge growth in investment because the industry actually believe that there's something behind this technology and we'll talk about it in a second. So why, what's the problem of describing blockchain? Why it's so hard? Because it's a map. And how do you describe a map? It's not something, there's no analogy that I can actually use from the real world to describe this formula or other formula that are associated with blockchain. This is one of the few things and algorithms that involve in blockchain. And that's really one of the problem. And usually where people try to explain technology, I say don't explain technology with technology. And that's part of the problem. When you explain technology with technology, you fail. And to explain technology with a math is even harder. And think about it, now you have to run a business and you try to explain to executive how, what is that, right? What is that meaning of that algorithm? So we have a very sophisticated, very complex type of a model that we're basically trying to, basically to explain and what it's meaning. So because of a lack of pure analogy or one-to-one -one analogy in, in the real world to the virtual world, and let me describe it for a second, because we're ta all talking about, for example, wallet. There's a digital wallet, here's a wallet, right? People can correlate and what's analogy one-to-one. -one. We probably can't, and because we can't, what happened, many of the individuals that try to explain this technology fall into very funny analogies, right? To try to explain what it is, but the problem, there's many concepts that this technology actually bring to the table, and every one of those analogies that I'll talk about in a second is actually representing only one, maybe two concepts in the blockchain technology. So one example, and this is this falling piano, and they're basically trying to, basically to, conv to convey a concept that a fact that you can, unreversible fact, and everybody actually can attest to that fact, right? So you have this falling piano, and the story behind that one, it falls in the middle of the street, except the people that it kills, oh, uh, hopefully not. It falls on the street, and then you tie a polygraph to those individuals that are all around immediately, and you ask them, have you seen a falling piano? And likely you'll get, majority of them, all of them will say yes, with the idea that you cannot get more than 50% somehow convinced otherwise before actually you manage actually to put the polygraph in front of them. It's a very strange concept, very strange analogy, trying to accept what actually happened over here. And that's basically described that some of the uh, technology really is immutable and it's actually publicly recognized and so on and so on. Uh, the love gate or this is uh, what you see in a few places in the world. You see those bridges and people basically uh, talk about uh, uh, love forever and just they forget that most of the cases love is never really for forever. But the blockchain it is, right? To some extent and we'll explain it in a second. So there is something that is immutable in the concept in the blockchain but people are trying to explain it in, in this form. So clearly analogies are almost good but we're in a business, we're in a world, you run business with that one, how can you talk about almost, right? And you have to sort of figure out, you really have to understand it. So that's where we're going from here. So here's another analogy that I really want to describe, and this is what happened in a Yap Island. And you can see actually where it, it resides in the Pacific Ocean in the west side. And interesting enough, this culture that actually um, already between the 400 to 1500 AD, actually using something that's called public ledger. We all know about ledger, right, as you can call it a, the book of record or database, whatever you want to call it, right? So we have ledger, and this culture actually using these huge stones as currency. But what do they do? Because these currency are such a big stones, a huge stones, they actually telling the story from word to mouth over the generation who owns what and who have what portion of the stone belongs to him. And that's a public ledger. This is exactly what blockchain is. It is a public ledger that's available, distributed, not exist actually in one spot like in the government supported, and that's what actually Bitcoin is all about, right? And here we have an engine that 
survived for many, many years. Is that a currency? I would say yes. So our conversation, and you see it's becoming very philosophical, it was used even after today to represent a treaty between tribes. Actually, there's an interesting story that one of the stones, while it was mined from another island, and they actually carried it, it fell into the sea. It fell on the sea, but because they all remembered and the story we're talking about it, they will associate that to with somebody owns it. So the story is actually even talking about is something that nobody actually can see. And that's exactly, again, the blockchain technology in that context. So interesting stories in the history and analogy, but you can actually can see that what we're talking about, actually, in some respect, pieces of it exist in, in one form or another one in the blockchain. So, one interesting in, in, uh, concept, and I'll just uh, uh, sort of like a very quickly summarize, you s we're now discovering that blockchain technology is such a phenomenon, such a powerful technology, that almost every industry is actually considering using it, all the way from voting, because my vote is really critical. I want it to be on a record, right? It's immutable. You cannot change it. It's recorded, right? Over there somewhere that everybody can actually see that I voted. You maybe not see what I am voted for, and I can only do it once in that context. So I can actually uh, record those transactions. All the way from interesting uh, recent uh, startup that actually came up to actually how to record diamonds, precious stones. Diamonds actually have a very unique chemical signature. That signature is recorded. So if, if somebody stole my diamond and tried to sell it, right, he can actually can check who owned that diamond. And it actually can be publicly available. So now we're seeing a technology that allows us to record stuff and transact stuff in a very sophisticated way. It's called blockchain because every record is based computationally wise, and I, I won't go into the detail, on the previous records. So there is like blocks of records and each one of them is calculated based on the previous one. Now, because it's distributed, there's no one copy. There's many copies of the same ledger appear in many places around the world. Where they appear doesn't matter, but just in visualize it that there are many entities, nodes, in the network, right? that all of them, in order to record something, they have to compute something, and if you try to manipulate one record, the other ones will find it because their calculation will not fit yours. So they all have to get the same answer. So it's interesting enough, there is no way, almost theoretically, only theoretically you can do it, but physically to convince all of the nodes on the network to conspire to change at least 50% of them to conspire in one way. So we have a very interesting concept of distributed ledger that sits in very many, many spots. Now, one of the phenomena that's actually happening right now is that uh, no, many of the nodes that are actually managing and computing those transactions are called miners because the, there is a limited computation, uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, virtual resources, and that's the defined by default somehow in the model itself, like Bitcoin. It's not unbounded, it is bounded. So there is a process that analogy is trying to mine those things. So the miners that actually mine the Bitcoins, today we actually seeing more than 50% of them exist in China, which scares the United States. And that's the reason you start seeing competing idea, different blockchain solution Right? Evolving just to avoid getting involved into competing or somebody trying to basically to fraud the system. Now, another analogy, another concept that I'll share with you is the concept of public blockchain versus a private one. The public blockchain refer usually to the Bitcoin blockchain, right? The private one refer to a network of participants, and this could be basically whoever uh, you trust, and you create your, your own network, and you don't need to deal with the coin, right? You just deal with the computation that you need to do. So let's talk about for a second, what is the opportunity usually for bank in this space? Uh, 
and this is a little bit technical, but I'll hopefully we'll pass that one. So uh, usually, because blockchain is a ledger, right? Interesting enough, you don't see bank replacing the ledger with the blockchain. There's not even an initiative like that one. And the question is why? Actually, it's very simple. You don't replace digital rail with another digital rail. Why? Because it's very costly proposition. That's why you, you don't see bank jumping Excite, exciting, excitingly, actually, to replace their legacy system, right? You don't see it. It's too costly, too risky, too timely, and so on. So the left side, when you try to actually to use distributed ledger, right, or, or blockchain technology, very few opportunities reside on the left side. So let's go on the right side. When on the right side, you really see some new opportunity with new initiative actually emerging a new market even emerging, and some of those are really transforming some existing business processes where they are partially manual or fully manual to a technology that now can do amazing stuff. For example, when we talk about blockchain, remember the block, there is entity on over there. Usually they represent transaction. But the amazing things post the Bitcoin phenomena that instead of just representing a transaction that actually transfer money between one entity to another one, people actually thought about it and came with the great idea that that transaction can represent a contract. So it means it's basically a, a code that actually sit somewhere on the network and will be executed. So it represents, for example, an ownership, an ownership of a house, an ownership of a car, an ownership of anything that you can basically imagine, an ownership of a diamond. That's a contract. If the house belonged to me, only I and I will be, because I'm, uh, the house is unique and me is basically unique, if I, it all, if, and this is part of the problem in the mortgage industry, usually all around the world, particularly I know in the United States, how do you prove an ownership, right? Because it's so unique and it's so it, it, you cannot actually break the system. Nobody actually managed actually to demonstrate how you do that one. Therefore, the, you, there's a level of trust that now built in the environment that basically show I, if I transact, I'll, only I can actually move the ownership to somebody else. And that being recorded, it's another transaction. The transaction itself can be multi-signatory in that respect. So the people actually can move asset from one to another one in, in a very, um, I would say, smart way. And that's what you start hearing, smart contract. Now, the beauty of some, from a technology perspective, banks don't have to build a huge infrastructure actually to do the one. Almost there is no infrastructure they actually need to carry. So let's go to the new high. This is a representing where you can use a blockchain. In the middle, we can actually use some optimization. And what we see primarily when you have a lot of intermediaries. In the trading, for example, we talk about three days to basically to prove to get trade confirmation. Why does it take three days, right? Because there is element of trust, right? That doesn't necessarily exist and you have to move it from one place to another one. The process is very cumbersome. Some of them even semi-manual. Today, with blockchain, you can actually move it to T0 almost instantly. You remove the intermediaries, right? The custodian that actually sitting over. You don't need a custodian, and that's part of the, the concept in a blockchain. So money can move without entity, even bank, actually being in the center of that process. So now when you're talking about what really the opportunity for the bank, it really depends what role you're taking. Am I a market maker? or a market player. And, and I'll give you an example for a second as we're going. On the market player, there's a company named Wave. Wave is actually a company in a foreign exchange. I'm sorry, foreign trade, not exchange. In a foreign trade. In a foreign trade business, there's a lot of players. There's the shipper, the receiver, there's the insurance, there's the bank, there is, God knows, all of the entities that exist over there. Interesting, this company, it's an Israeli company, startup, that actually decided, wow, we can create a market, right? And we as a bank, just one player in this market, where everything is actually done, recorded in an unmutable way, right? In a very secure way, 
that nobody has yet managed even to figure out how to break into it, because of what I described before. So we as a bank will be a player in this market, in the wave market. And actually, there will probably will be many wave players, waves uh, markets, and the bank will pick the cheapest one. Today, for example, if it costs $200 to, to, to do one transaction to manage it, it probably will go to $20. So we're talking about a very significant cost reduction. On the left side, there's a company named R3, and somebody actually asked me in, in the break about R3. R3 is a, today is a consor it's, no, it's not a consortium, but there are 43 or 45 already members in this, uh, in this startup that joined the startup to actually to try to find use cases in a financial world, like in the trading, where a lot of the processes actually can be removed completely, and now we're actually now doing everything electronically. And we'll talk about it, what is the meaning in a second. Now, we as a bank, we can actually play in a different role. We can play in the P2P as a lending, if we create a market, although there are some market today, Ripple and some other ones, but we can create them ourselves, remittance, currency exchange, and again, not necessarily move Bitcoin, we can move asset or anything else, or, any, and again, it doesn't have to be a full currency in that context. So there's many even competing currency to the Bitcoin using different blockchain technology. Now, uh, what is the business challenges? And I describe it to you, those are, those are challenges that I'm as a CTO actually facing um, on a regular basis. How do you explain to the board the impact of that technology when it's so complex even to describe it, right? So we literally, we spent, there is a two hour sessions that we're actually taking and it took some of the board members just to explain how it is all work and what potentially those will have an impact on us, on our industry. Uh, and again, uh, remember, blockchain is about the network. It's not something that I do for myself. I know it's something that I do with others. So it's not something that I build a system like a CRM or any other system, it's a something that actually now I have to find other actors that participate with me in creating a, a, a market or participate in the market as, as a player. There's an opportunity to ask to cannibalize. Uh, so for example, we, because there's no dependency, you can actually remove yourself almost from being a custodian in some respect. So this is a challenge that us as a as a bank, at what point we build a solution that cannibalize on our capabilities today. And we recognize if we don't do it, others will do it. So we'll have to be in this kind of a game, but in what form and how we actually will do that, that's a different question. And what's about the regulators? Would the regulatory bodies will approve this kind of emotion, uh, this kind of technology? Well, we think some sign in the UK, at least two companies, one circle, one, I forgot the other, other guy's name, that already is really open to the use of this kind of technology. So it's basically opening more competition to the financial institution. I don't know what will happen in Israel, which will be very interesting to see. But my guts tell me that because of the confidence in the technology, uh, what we have seen, uh, for example, with Bitcoin, nobody actually managed to break the network of the Bitcoin yet, right? And it's actually unlikely uh, that somebody will actually will manage it because what I described over here in a few minutes, the complexity is too hard, too costly to try to do that one. Uh, so how do we measure also the success and the risk associated with the new model that uh, basically represent almost, and I would dare to say, the Bitcoin is, is a new economical model or a new construct that we haven't really even anticipated it a few years ago. So is it really fit to the same economical model that we actually discussed it in the past? I don't know, I don't have an answer for you because again, I'm not an economist, I'm just uh, throwing some questions. And how do you prove to the business actually things that work or does work? And you deal with technology that is evolving so rapidly, right? The rate of investment in this technology and literally almost every month there's another startup with another idea in improving the technology that we're actually talking about that originally was invited uh, to support the Bitcoin. Uh, so what is this technology mature? Uh, first, uh, a lot of this is still evolving, as I mentioned. 
we will see some more mature platform that develop us to do those things like that. Um, we need to have some more uh, abstraction, although this is very abstract by itself. We want a structure that enable to take for us a different concept and actually model them effectively in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the mathematical model. Uh, Bitcoin, the network of Bitcoin, because every time you do a transaction, there's an element of a Bitcoin that sits over there that is basically being mined, and its value fluctuates because of the, market, the value of the Bitcoin, because it's just another currency. That leads us to have an unpredictable cost of transaction. And we as a bank, we don't like un something that's unpredictable, right? So some of the new technology is a blockchain, especially in a private blockchain, remove this constraint of, and, and we can get the practicability of the cost. Uh, the speed really need to evolve. What happened is there right now, and again, this is an example of the blockchain that support the Bitcoin. It's very much dependent on hardware, and, and this is called ASIC, that actually make it very costly to entity to be a node, right? The alternative, the, the, like Ethereum and some other technology that actually coming up or that being adopted very rapidly now in the market, that primarily in, in a private blockchain, actually remove the dependence in the hardware and really players can actually participate in an equal basis. Um, more better environment and the ability to leverage existing business networks, right? Those are the few things that we see. So how do we describe if it's disruptive or not disruptive? And this is something that uh, uh, usually the way, uh, there's a lot of theory behind that one, but uh, if I have to usually to, to judge, I will say, if you meet two of the two, you probably have a disruptive technology. And, and if you just take a look very quickly, what really happening? So from a technology perspective, is it really better? So a question that needs to be asked, easier to develop with. Not necessarily yet, the complexity is still there, uh, but I think it's evolving. Is it safer? Absolutely safer. We recognize it, that it, the, the technology is there and it's absolutely safer. Enable new business model? Yes, absolutely new business model. You create a new marketplaces, right? Like, the, for example, in the blockchain uh, with, the, with the diamond, right? Where you create something very new. Uh, we can talk about uh, different marketplaces all the way for remittance in all around the world that basically bypass the banks, right? Uh, with a very low cost of transaction. And partially, and again, why Bitcoin so success succeeded, it's probably, its blockchain is the most successful in, uh, proof of that kind of a model by itself. Uh, is it faster? Not yet from the business perspective. Is it cheaper? We believe that it is, but it's still a things to actually to prove because it depends on the model that you do. But really what counts, it's really what the customers really think about the application of using a blockchain. So is it easier to use? Again, that's to be, to be determined, uh, application will be, but there is more and more application that actually hide the entire concept that you're actually running on the blockchain. Who cares what you're running underneath? And in it, as long as you deliver something. Is it safer? Absolutely safer. Uh, enable me to do new things? Yes. Likely faster? Absolutely. Cheaper? Yes. So we see already characteristics that this is definitely going to be a very disruptive type of technology. Uh, some of the other things, some of the challenges that I think we will see in the future, the regulatory is really a big, big, big question that they'll have to figure out how to, to look at those things and how to address them because you have a full traceability right, in this kind of a model. Uh, and that's, that's the beauty also in one respect and, and some will argue maybe uh, on the other side. Uh, less cash, we definitely will see less cash. So we will be cashless environment and less fiat. And this is something that I believe uh, if it will be regula regulated, and a lot of the startup really working now to open basically their books, their, log their technology to their regulators because they don't necessarily in the business of silknet and so on. So this is something that will be done. Some of the description, I'll skip that on a technical side, but what I basically want to summarize, um, 
regardless what you believe in a Bitcoin, and it, that it's a currency that fluctuates like almost, I would say, any other currency. If you think it succeeds or fail, it really doesn't matter what we believe in the technology, that it's absolute disruptive technology that probably will change the face of the financial industry. And not only that, all of the industry by it, uh, as a whole. Thank you very much. Let me uh, introduce uh, Roy Seabag, who uh, will talk about how all this stuff gets put together into a practical business model that works and uh, serves consumers. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Sabag. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gold Money. So we, we've just heard of two forms of genetically modified money. Now I'm going to tell you about whole money. So I'm going to start with um, discussing the evolution of money. And then I'm going to tell you about how gold money works, our company, our technology, really. And then lastly, uh, discuss some of our business metrics uh, and some of what we've seen. So money is a very interesting thing. We spend our life really in pursuit of it. Um, but most of us don't really know what money is. Uh, and I find that uh, economists and people that are generally in control of money enjoy obfuscating uh, or making it difficult to understand. And so I'm going to um, try to simplify it for you. If you were to look up money uh, on Google or on Wikipedia, you generally see uh, that money can't be defined but rather its functions can be defined. And, and the three axioms that are generally used are, it'll be a unit of account, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's a ruler, a measuring system, sargel. Uh, it's a medium of exchange. In other words, it can act as an intermediary uh, between transactions and, and preserve uh, the value between them. And then lastly, it should be a store of value. In other words, it should, it should also store the value of the transaction in between. Um, but we've thought a lot about this, and we, we think a very simple way of understanding money is that money is simply stored labor. Think of it as a battery that's taking in all the energy, the time, the labor, the hours, the effort that you're exerting in your life and storing it for you so that you can spend it in the future. And philosophically, we believe that that battery should hold at maximum charge until you're ready to spend that, that labor. Uh, it shouldn't erode, it shouldn't decay. What we've seen lately is the world is really becoming a lot more global. Uh, we have more friends and family abroad than ever. We travel more globally. Um, we do more business internationally. And as a response, money has kind of become a sort of technology. Uh, everything that you're used to using, whether it's an ATM machine, a check, a credit or debit card, something like PayPal or Apple Pay, these are really innovations uh, at the outer layer that are simply optimizing the communication of money. They're, they're not really revolutionizing anything at the bottom layer. Uh, they're just making it simpler to move the value of money. If you actually uh, try to extend any of these technologies across borders, you start to find how it breaks down. Uh, there are 190 different national currencies, different regional settlement systems that are very inefficient. Settlement times are very long. Uh, foreign exchange fees are very high. Um, and, and there's a lot of price volatility. And so let's take a step back and, and look at gold. What exactly is gold? We, we say that gold is global money. It's, it's one money that's simultaneously global. And, and this is solidified not in economics, but rather in physics and math. Gold isn't tied to any national economy. And gold, as I'll show you in the next slide, is essentially a battery that's permanently storing units of energy, labor, time, and information. Again, nothing to do with economics, pure physics. Let us go through why gold is the perfect money. The first principle you must understand about gold, and this has taken Josh and I about a decade to figure out, um, and we haven't really seen gold ever explained this way, and it's a little bit dense, so if you don't understand it the first time, don't worry, we'll make the slide available. It took us probably a decade to figure this out. 
<laughs> so the first principle of gold, really, is you have to realize that it evolved as money in physics. There wasn't some grand economist 6,000 years ago that got together and decided, and now it shall be gold. This was a, a market process that really evolved in Darwinian-like fashion over millions and millions of experiments, thousands of years, amongst diverse cultures in different continents. And all of them together resolved, our ancestors all resolved that gold was money. And so let me explain why. For 6,000 years, curious minds from Aristotle to Newton have classified 92 natural elements in our physical universe. Everything you touch or feel is an element or compound. Everything we build or invent relies on an inexorable causal relationship ultimately commencing with the elements. I don't care if you founded a startup or if you're farming or if you have a manufacturing business. The causal relationship between what you produce will ultimately commence with the elements. The elements of a are a part of our natural systems. Their proportional abundance in the earth is very well understood. We've had a lot of time to study the elements and study how rare they are in relation to each other. We know how rare copper is to iron. We know how rare carbon, you know, you hear about diamonds, it's just carbon, condensed carbon. There's actually nothing that special about diamonds. Um, are, are rare, you know, say to copper or to lithium. The, the relative abundance is very important. We, by this, at this point, we, ve we understand this very well. This proportional constant is bound by the same physical laws governing the movements of the stars, our planet, our universe. Extracting elements requires an input of energy, labor, time, and information. We call these the input units. Gold is, mathematically speaking, the rarest of mind elements. Therefore, it has a fixed proportional relationship to other elements, not in economic terms, not in fiat currencies, but in units of energy, labor, time, and information. But gold also has another trick. It's immortal. It doesn't tarnish, it doesn't rot, it doesn't evaporate or decay. It doesn't have a life cycle, and for reasons that are still unbeknownst to most physicists, it doesn't have an entropic cycle, it resists entropy. Everything around you is exposed to entropy, will eventually trend towards disorder, will eventually decay, including yourself. But gold, for whatever reason, doesn't have this feature. And so what happens is, as the arrow of time progresses, all the gold mined grows in size as one cumulative stock. But what's cool about this is it gets naturally exchanged amongst market participants, humans all over the world over many, many years in exchange for their units of time and labor and energy and information. And so it creates a sort of a web. And then subsequently, this stock of gold, all this gold, think of it as one big block except it's owned by billions of people, is bid up or down every day in proportional units of energy, time, labor, and information. And the price is the clearing price at which it reaches equilibrium. This equilibrium level reflects the proportional value at a specific moment in time, not for gold, which is just this piece of metal, but rather for all these inputs of energy, labor, time, and information. And if the price falls below equilibrium, the input units become comparatively skewed, leading to a reversion, as humans, participants in a, mar in a free market economy, will immediately act by arbitraging diminishing input units uh, for gold. In other words, the price of gold becomes, uh, goes below its, its fixed proportional level to the other units, then people will say, hey, I've got a lot of energy here, I've got a lot of time, or I produce tomatoes, or I produce apples, I can now acquire gold at below what it would cost to mine the gold. Inversely, and, and under this scenario, no new mining would, would, new mining would cease. Um, conversely, if the price rises above the equilibrium level, then the inverse takes place. And, and this, a new supply regulates the price back to equilibrium. In conclusion, the laws of physics are what guarantee gold's perpetual superiority to diminishing input units of energy, labor, time, and information. Now this is important because anthrop anthropology, anthropologically, gold became an intermediate commodity money, 
between cooperative transactions representing any service or good with an input of energy, labor, time, and information, which is basically anything. Anything you can think of has those as input units. Gold allows its holder to transcend time through preservation of surplus. That's the key. So I just gave you the physics. I don't expect all of you to understand that. But let me show you how this works in math, in practice. Let's compare someone living in gold versus living in what is arguably the world's strongest uh, fiat currency, unbacked. Fiat means unbacked, currency that's unbacked. Uh, so let's compare someone living in the world's strongest unbacked currency, US dollars, someone living in gold. In 1985, the price of a Big Mac, kosher Big Mac, uh, would be $1.60. In 2015, the price of that same Big Mac would be $4.79. Conversely, if you were looking at things under a gold system, or if you were living in gold, the price of a Big Mac in 1985 would be 0.15 grams. Whereas today, in 2015, the price of a Big Mac is 0.13 grams. In other words, it's actually cheaper today. I, I, try to think if anything in your life has gotten cheaper over the, over the arrow of time. The price of a truck, brand new truck in 1985 was $9,000. $9, the price of a truck today is about $28,000. Switching this into gold, the price of a truck in 1985 was 857 grams. And today, the price of that same truck, 739 grams. The price of fuel, we hear that fuel's gone down a lot. Well, it was $1.16 a gallon at 1985, and now it's $2.51. Conversely, in gold, price of fuel is down from 0.11 grams in 1985 to 0.07 grams today. And lastly, let's look at an actual service. Uh, we're all at a movie theater here. Let's say you wanted to buy a movie ticket, 1985. It was $2.75. Today it's $10.25. Conversely, a, a movie ticket in 1985 was 0.26 cents. And today it's uh, 0 0.2 cents. So it's actually higher. And, and maybe that's due to uh, Marvel and 3D and all that. But uh, you are getting a better product, I'd argue. The gold market is massive. This is another misconception, especially in the West. And we're all relatively fortunate to be living uh, in a Western economy with relatively stable, unbacked currencies. Um, we heard about cryptocurrencies. If you take the aggregate cumulative size of uh, cryptocurrencies, Ether, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Weedcoin, all the different coins, uh, they're $10 billion. If you take all the physical cash in the world, this is research that Josh and I did, uh, not the uh, M2, M3, not even the M1, but the actual circulating banknotes, it's $7 trillion. And if you take all the gold in the world, mined since the beginning of time, that large block that I mentioned earlier, though it's not a block, it's equally distributed, it's, it's, it's relatively democratically distributed, it's also $7 trillion. And it trades about $70 billion a day. So whether people like to admit it or not, uh, the gold market is massive. Uh, and it's actually the second most, most liquid instrument after the Euro USD, uh, even in the FX market. So gold is the world's best performing currency by a wide margin. It's not, it, there, there isn't even competition. You know, you heard that uh, uh, the purchasing power of the US dollar, which is the world's best currency, has declined by 84%. Um, in, in 50 years, you know, I can show you other fiat currencies where it's declined that much in the last six months. Um, but, but using gold as money hasn't been easy or practical for 40 years, with no modern banking or payment apps innovation until now. The rules are changing. Uh, people are more empowered than they've ever been. We're seeing, especially with the millennial generation, uh, a lot more interest to organize and create what I consider to be not only disruptive businesses, but businesses that probably never would have existed 10 or 15 years ago. If you take something like Uber or Airbnb or Zipcar, these are businesses that are basically illegal par excellence, but they've created such a large movement, a political movement, that when, say, Uber gets outlawed in France, uh, Uber sends an email to one million of their members, those members write to the mayor, and Uber is then reinstated. And so, these people, they want money that's protected. They want choice. They want something accessible, something that can move with them wherever they are. And so I'd like to introduce you to our company, which is called Gold Money. 
And we are the world's largest gold savings and payments network. Using technology to make gold acceptable through a modern global network, making it the best way to save and spend your money anywhere in gold. We're not a bank. Gold money will give citizens worldwide more direct control over their purchasing power than they ever had before. Let's look at the evolution of the gold market and how we've changed it. Historically, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the way that gold was purchased, uh, gold was actually very inaccessible to the average person before we created this technology. Uh, it was something that was mostly available to the elites, to central banks, to hedge funds. Uh, it was very costly for the average investor to enter the game. They'd have to arrange for shipping, for storage, for insurance costs. The settlement time for gold before we, we built this technology was T5. That means five days to settle physical metal. Uh, the general public will normally pay 3 to 5% physical premiums for gold. I uh, believe that if you went out to the jewelry store down the street, you'd probably pay even 10 or 20% premiums. And of course, there's, there was never really utility or payment capabilities uh, for gold in and of itself. There were various gold standards experimented with uh, throughout history. But that's different. Um, along came the gold ETF, which many of you may have heard of. It's called the GLD. There are other derivatives now around the world. It solved the liquidity problem. It was very liquid to buy and sell it, although it was only available to people with a brokerage account. It was a security by default. Um, it, it made it fast and accessible for investors, but the average annual fee is around half a percent a year, and the ETF itself will trade at a premium to the underlying gold value, uh, generally 50 basis points to 1%. You don't really own gold when you buy an ETF. If you read the prospectus carefully, um, there may be physical backing of the ETF. There may be uh, paper certificates. The gold may be leased. It may be not. May be rehypothecated. It may be not. Um, it's not easily transferable, and there's no underlying payment system. You know, you're basically buying the gold. It gathers dust, and then you sell it if you want to crystallize again. What we did was we built an entirely new uh, technology that deals in fully allocated. 0.999 or better bullion. We provide a real-time purchase and settlement system that's available either online through the desktop or through your mobile phone where you can start to buy or sell metal in as little as 0.01 grams. In other words, four US cents, 12 agurot. You could start buying real gold. We give you free storage and insurance through Brinks. We partnered with Brinks and we have 106 vaults around the world where you can store the metal. We offer unprecedented pricing of only 1% off the spot price, both in and out. And we give you full payment capabilities. So once you have the gold, you don't just have to sit on it, you can actually use it. You can send it to anyone with an SMS, mobile phone, email address, whether or not they're on the system. You can invite them in by sending them gold. We also offer you redemption options. And so you can redeem the gold balance either back to currency you can redeem it uh, into your credit card. We give you a, uh, a gold card that looks just like this, MasterCard, allowing you to spend the gold. Or Josh has got some of our cubes over there. You can actually redeem the physical metal in as little as 10 grams. We were the first ones to reduce the redeemability down to 10 grams. And so all of your value is fully backed. Uh, we heard recently that uh, you know central banks don't need to back their currency, but then we also heard that you know, their existence is threatened. And so I, 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 I think maybe the two have something to do with each other. We launched this business a year ago, Josh and I. It was just a little idea we had. We had the idea about three years ago, four years ago. Uh, and uh, we got very much involved with the Bitcoin space early on. Uh, in fact, a lot of people don't know, but Josh and I uh, have the 1500th largest wallet uh, on the blockchain. Uh, from Bitcoins that we own. So we, we understand Bitcoin very well. Our CTO also was uh, uh, head of security for Ripple. Um, but we found that Bitcoin uh, is a poorly conceived uh, experiment in terms of it's, it's really not, con it's not consistent with where we are in financial services with respect to reversibility of transactions, KYC, AML, transaction anonymity. And so what we built was um, something that kind of rhymes with PayPal. It's a closed loop network. But at the same time, it's using gold as the only unit of account. And so what we've been able to do in one year is uh, sign up over 1 million users. We have 1,050,000 users around the world. 
We have over $1.7 billion in the system in metal value. And we're running about $55 million to $60 million a month in transactions. So uh, almost a billion dollars right now. It's only been a year. We've democratized access to gold savings. Gold has never been this accessible before. And we're building global client relationships and unlocking the network utility of this global money base. Um, just a little bit more on the, on the technology and the regulation. Um, the platform is really built into three parts. It's got this digital ledger and a private exchange where we signed up counterparties from all over the world to quote bid and bids and offers. Uh, but the, but the uh, technology also is c integrated into Brinks. And so it's like an operating system that helps you manage your gold position. Buy it, store it, move it, send it. But we actually act as a trusted, limited third party. We are a bailor under property rights, common law property rights, and you are the bailee. And so essentially, it's your property right. It's no different than when you uh, go to a valet and park your car. If you look at the blurb on the back, uh, it's your car still. The valet is just parking it for you. And so that's the same legal construct that governs our relationship. Uh, we are simply helping facilitate transactions with your metal. Brinks itself is acting as custodian. And Lloyd's of London insures all the gold. And so um, under an insolvency or under a scenario where, uh, for whatever reasons, our operations um, would fail, uh, it would be inconvenient, but all the gold would be returned. All of this uh, uh, corporate governance is audited by KPMG. We do what's known as an ISAE 3402 audit. Uh, we're one of the uh, only companies in the world to do this audit, where KPMG does spot checks twice a year and counts all the metal reports back. Um, we're regulated by two regulators in Canada, by FinTrac, uh, which is the money service business regulator. And we also have a branch in Jersey in the Channel Islands, and we're regulated by the Jersey Financial Service Commission. Uh, we do all our own risk monitoring, global compliance, uh, and as I said, all the metal is fully insured. So it's important to understand that unlike with Bitcoin, uh, with gold money, you are not outside the regulatory system. But you do move outside the central banking system to a gold-backed global debit platform that is more effective global payments and savings network. So you're not outside the regulatory system, but you are outside the banking system. So again, let's look at how this works one more time. Think of everything that you're familiar with in the financial system today as existing in these concentric circles that, that at, you know, at their base, at their nucleus, are central banks. The central banks will issue a certain fiat currency and then, on, and then on top of that circle will be all these organizations, the commercial banks, the data providers, the credit card companies, the PayPals, the fintech companies. But every time money moves, it has to pay a toll through each of these circles. And so what we allow you to do is go from that world into our world where you convert value from that world, inputs of energy, labor, time, and information, into a gold balance. That gold balance settles within minutes. And you can keep that balance with us for savings, or you can use the gold for purchases. You can continue to consume, live your life. Uh, Al Friedberg and I had dinner tonight. We paid with gold. Um, you can send or receive the gold to anyone in the world, as I mentioned, through the internet rail. So in fact, you can open an account with zero balance and request a payment in. You can send someone an invoice for your time, your labor, you can redeem the gold back out for 1%, as I mentioned before. Take physical delivery or load your card. As a technology, as a company, we think our model is unique because we're not a bank. We don't fractionally reserve your deposit, so we don't take one unit that you deposit and lend out eight times. Uh, we don't really uh, even engage uh, in lending, and when we do, it'll be uh, fully collateralized from our own balance sheet. Uh, we're a global platform with direct customer relationships around the world. We have a very strong and growing user base. We're a closed loop system, which makes it very difficult to penetrate. In other words, it's not inconceivable for a hacker to um, gain access to our network or our system, whether individually or at the master level, but all the gold itself is sitting in physical form it brings. So unless the hacker elevates the threat of attack um, and, and it introduces physical, uh, a physical dimension, um, all the gold will remain, and due to various protocols that we have in place, um, the gold really rarely leaves the vaulting system. That, that's the way it works. Um, we really are pro-compliance. 
Uh, both Josh and I had successful careers in financial services before this. I ran a, a long, short hedge fund, and Josh was, as, uh, as Bob said, senior metal strategist at Goldman. So we, we actually went into this uh, for one year just spending time with regulators, trying to figure out if there was a legal way to do this, and we did. And we offer our own customer support as well. Um, we have about 16 uh, patents, uh, either uh, that have been published or uh, close to being published. Uh, we also acquired some other patents, so we really own this whole idea of using gold in commerce uh, or gold in digital transactions. So there are three types of accounts at Gold Money. There's the personal account, which helps you uh, open an account for free, start building a savings, um, request gold in, just like you would do with PayPal. There's no minimums, no monthly fees. We provide you with free storage, free insurance. We give you a free card. We give you a, a plastic one for free, which is this one right here. You get the gold money fraud and purchase protection. So if you buy from another merchant on the platform, we protect you from fraud or loss. Uh, you get access to the mobile app, and you get access to our uh, community. We have uh, several thousand members, very active and growing community. There's the gold money business account, which is really uh, right for small businesses or online business engaging in online commerce. The business account is very powerful. It allows you to instantly accept e-commerce payments, donations, subscription payments. You can install a gold money button on your website. And then you gain access to all of our processing methods. So because there's so many ways to move money into our network, whether it's credit card or, or Bitcoin or uh, wire transfers, um, by being a merchant on the platform, you gain access to all those processing mechanisms for free. I think we have like 30 or 40 processing mechanisms now. Um, we, we give you a very powerful invoicing tool uh, with item libraries, with uh, customer lists, and you can even just use the system. Say you don't care about gold and, and, you, and you don't believe us that gold is good money. Um, you can just settle out. In other words, you can set your account to, to take any gold that's coming in and instantly settle it back to fiat, back to your bank account. So you're only paying a 1% fee. So in a way, you're hacking uh, a credit card uh, cost. Say if you use PayPal, it's 2.9 plus 30 cents plus FX. Here it'd be 1%. Um, and of course, you get online support as well. And then lastly, we have the wealth, wealth division. We call it Gold Money Wealth. And Gold Money Wealth is really uh, an upgraded account. It provides you, in addition to just ho holding gold, you can actually hold nine different fiat currencies under a fully reserved basis. Uh, you can also buy other noble metals. Remember I told you that gold had another trick, it's immortal? There are actually seven other elements of the 92 that are immortal, uh, but three are just infinitesimally rare, like osmium and iridium. Uh, but there are, there are four others that are actually considered noble metals, um, and, and they are silver, platinum, and palladium. Now, silver, platinum, and palladium will, over time, also outperform any fiat currency, but the issue with those is that they're exposed to the industrial cycle, so they're a lot more speculative. Uh, and so a lot of people like to say silver is like gold on steroids. So we allow you to buy silver and platinum and palladium through gold money wealth. Uh, with Gold Money Wealth, you actually get access to a personal relationship manager. You can phone your orders. You can buy and sell a lot more efficiently. Uh, and at Gold Money Wealth, we give you these really cool metal gold cards. So bring it all together. Uh, let me uh, discuss some of our business metrics. Um, like I said, we launched last year. Uh, we did the unusual step of going public on the TSX in Canada uh, right with our launch. Uh, we felt that though we weren't a bank, we needed some type of a transparency layer so that people would trust us. You could see we have an independent board, corporate governance, uh, file financials, uh, audited by KPMG, et cetera. Um, and we then acquired uh, this business, actually, Gold Money. Believe it or not, the company Josh and I started was called BitGold. Um, we've raised $72 million in the last 12 months. Um, we have basically, uh, one of the coolest things that I think have happened to us is we were able to get Daryl McMullen who was the CEO of PayPal Canada, and before that, the CEO of eBay Canada. He joined as our CEO. Um, and we have uh, launched business accounts, reached one million users, and we uh, have also grad graduated to the main, uh, main market in Canada, the main listing exchange. Here you can see some more details of our metrics, uh, you know, from zero to one million signups, um, deposit and transaction volume. One of the interesting things that we've shown that people didn't believe is that um, people want to spend gold. Before we started this, uh, a lot of the gold bugs used to say to me, um, no one that understands gold will use it. They'll just use their fiat and they'll store their gold. 
And uh, we've proven that that's not the case. And there are a lot of reasons why, if you're in Brazil, if you're in Japan, or if you're in Australia, if you're in any of these countries that um, kind of systematically lose value to gold, uh, you'd much rather be exposed to gold as much as you can and only spend the fiat. Uh, here you can see a graph that's interesting. It shows how quickly we reached one million users. And some of the other companies that you see here, the only one to actually have beat us is Facebook. Uh, the other companies are Uber and Airbnb. And so we've reached a million users in, I think, 12 months, which was uh, considered to be pretty rare. Um, and the business momentum itself, so the reason why we're growing so fast, this is another interesting thing, is because the business is so global. You know, you don't have to explain gold. I may have to explain gold here, but for four billion people, uh, gold is almost always at an all-time high in relation to their local currency. And so we have really a distributed user base. North America, Europe, South America, Africa, Oceanica. Um, really, like there's the, tra the system never sleeps. Uh, when we go to sleep, it gets active on another side of the planet. Um, and I think this is the most important metric. As the customer journey matures, the usage is accelerating. So the average transaction per user is, is growing at about 15% a month. In other words, people are using the system more and more. They're deriving more utility from the system. And our financials are growing as well. Uh, we, we've already, we've had two reported quarters. We're reporting our next quarter in, in one week. Uh, we've gone from uh, $66 million in revenue to 81 million. And our gross profit has gone from 1.05 million to 1.15 million. Um, and you know the world is really waking up to gold money. Uh, we've had a lot of really interesting mainstream media coverage from the Wall Street Journal to Bloomberg to CNBC, uh, Financial Times. Um, here you can see a photo of us ringing the bell on the Toronto Stock Exchange with, uh, with Mr. Friedberg uh, right there next to me. And just a word on our team. Um, like I said, our CEO is Daryl McMullen. He basically launched PayPal in Canada. Uh, before that, launched eBay in Canada. Josh Crum right here, um, myself, our, C our CFO uh, was actually our auditor at PwC and uh, was so impressed with what, with what was happening and she decided to join us. And our CTO is, is a very uh, interesting fellow. His name is Alessandro Promoli. Uh, he spent his career in encryption and cryptography, digital signatures. I, I had known the uh, founder of Ripple, Chris Larson, and he was a security consultant to Ripple. We, we actually like Ripple, we think it's the only one of these blockchains that, um, that actually makes sense. It's, it's got a consensus ledger and uh, it's being built within the regulatory system. So we were able to get uh, Alessandro to leave Ripple and join us and he kind of architected the whole system. So kind of entering year two, we're only in year two, this is what you can expect from us. Um, there's about $60 billion that goes into the gold market every year, whether through coins, ETFs, physical jewelry, and so we just think that if we can keep tapping into that growth, there's a very interesting savings business here, as we've done in the last year. Um, we will be expanding into other horizontals, such as wealth management and lending and insurance. Insurance is a very interesting one. When you think about some of the problems that uh, Dr. Blecher mentioned, um, it's basically becoming impossible for pension, pension funds and insurance companies to have any predictability in their long-term returns. So why not flip the model on its head? You pay in in weight, weight of gold, you get paid out in weight of gold. Um, those are some of the things we're working on. Uh, the payments business has is, is, is really got massive potential. We have to keep unlocking that network utility. And, and like we said, there's about $7 trillion of global base money that we're competing with. Uh, and just keep building the distributed gold network. So some of the things we're working on now is uh, working with banks to integrate this technology into their own white label. So you'd you know, log into your bank polyam account, and you'd have your checking account in shekels, you'd have your FX account in dollars, and you'd have your gold account. But your gold account would also function as your transactable account. You could move gold from there to say uh, your aunt in uh, Royal Bank of Canada. So we're launching an API uh, and other things. So that's it, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Donald. I'm from Houston, Texas. I appreciate the invitation. What, what if this was so successful that they're, since it's going worldwide and all these smaller countries, et cetera, and it grew to $4 trillion or $5 trillion, and are y'all taking gold off the market every time somebody buys something, so that means there's less liquidity in the gold market itself? The price of gold will adjust, remember what I said, to that equilibrium level where it clears. So it's not about how much gold there is physically. 
It's about what the value of that gold is in relation to everything else. So we're not disrupting the gold market anyway. We just may be organizing it better. Uh, but but like we said, you know, we're at two billion dollars. The gold market is at seven or eight trillion dollars, and so we're nowhere near that level yet. And uh, you know, I, I don't even see how that would happen. I think things are going to unfold a little differently. I'll add one more sort of comment as a, as a commodity economist. Even Wall Street talks about gold like a commodity. They, they analyze the gold market, you know, alongside copper or oil or grains. But all of these other commodities are totally different because they get consumed and because they decay. So when you buy, when you start buying a lot of copper, most of it goes into, you know, into copper wire and other things. So the little that's left gets bid up and, and, and gets into a backwardation or a premium. Uh, same with any other commodity because it's getting consumed in the supply chain. Gold is not a commodity. It does not get consumed. It, it is a stock of money that all of the money, all of the gold that's ever existed, even if it's in jewelry form, you just melt it down. So, so it's, it's, you know, gold, gold is a money stock. It's, it's not a commodity. Commodities trade based on their inventories. Uh, so, so, you know, there, there's a lot of economic thinking that's actually really been lost. I, I, I actually came to the conclusion of, of gold being money uh, when I was writing a, a report about the copper ETF. So, so in 2011, when the copper prices were going crazy, uh, everyone said, oh, you know, we've got a gold ETF, we've got a silver ETF, we need a copper ETF. And, and so I did all of the analysis and I said, how much would it cost to store copper in huge warehouses uh, or put it on, on floating uh, ships and tanks? And the cost of it was, was totally crazy. And I, and I wrote a report saying this is the dumbest idea, the dumbest product. Um, unfortunately, in the afternoon, Goldman file, filed a regulatory filing that they were launching a copper ETF. So uh, uh, I got a. The SEC ultimately said no. And the SEC ultimately said no. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but it never worked. And we compared every other commodity that's not money grains, oil, uh, and it's so costly to store because it rots, it decays. You have to put it on large ships. Uh, you know, the, the proportional amount of, of, of gold versus copper in the earth. Copper is 5,000 to one copper to gold. You put a price chart over time, over a long period of time, the, the average price difference is always 5,000 to one. It comes right back to that, that the, the crustal abundance. It has nothing to do with economics. It's purely just a, a function of how, how small and dense the value of copper is, or so gold is, to copper. So again, you know, because gold's a money stock, everything else just adjusts to it. It doesn't get squeezed like a like a um, like a commodity market. So so yeah, sorry, it's a long answer, but and I think in that in that respect, we should mention that gold doesn't make you rich. In other words, buying gold isn't going to make you rich. If if you see the price of gold rising nominally, it's only because there's an external introduction of fiat currency into the equation. So as I mentioned, the physics equation never really changes. It's just the money equation. So if gold goes to $10,000, your food costs are going to go up, your oil costs are going to go up, your service costs are going to go up. What gold is is an honest unit of account and store of value that you can use to preserve your purchasing power in between your next transaction. To get rich, you need to take risk. You need to buy stocks, you need to buy bonds, you need to start a business, you need to invest in real estate. Um, so, so that's the other thing that's important to realize is, you know, gold's proportional uh, 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 abundance is, is what's, what's regulating its price in relation to everything else. Uh, just to make it clear though, let's say I was very wealthy and I want to buy 50 million dollars worth through your card today. Wouldn't that be 50 million dollars that was then taken from one supply and put in your vault? So, so what would happen is you would wire 50 million dollars of, of fiat money that you've accumulated somehow. Right. And we would go in our exchange buy 50 million dollars of the gold yeah. from some bullion bank that bought it from some refiner, that bought it from some miner, that mined it by inputting energy, labor, and time. And, but, but, but that's the thing. Our exchange, the, the bullion is already in the vault. We didn't have to go get it anywhere because all gold sits in the vaults. So, so when you buy it, it's just a price clearing and they pick it up from one area, you know, maybe, you know, Scotia Makata, you pick it up the cage, walk it over to, to this, now it's your gold. It takes, it takes seconds. And, uh, and, and you didn't have to go find it because it already lives in the vault really believe that um, well you don't have to be rich it, it, gold does not make you rich but you, only if you're rich you buy gold right but um, not, anymore. Uh, not, anymore. not anymore okay every one of those axioms <laughs> yes no, but the point uh, i want to make was not that uh, the point i want to make is that uh, 
gold is not a, a simple commodity because people want to believe it's not a simple commodity. They want to, it has the credibility and, and the confidence that uh, you get from the fact that people believe that this is different. Um, uh, I, I, I completely uh, disagree with the view that the supply and demand are not, uh, uh, are determining the, the, the price in a direct way. The, the, it's true, the supply and demand, but is, there is a demand which comes from the fact that people believe this is a, this has a special value. The, um, the, the price of gold was uh, determined, could be determined, or should be determined if it doesn't have a, if it doesn't have a monetary value, let's say. Uh, it will be determined really by the use as a jewelry, and uh, in the past was well, Why would someone mine that economically? Why would someone produce it? Will, will nobody produce it on the, the, the marginal cost unless you do have a belief that you can sell it at, at this price? No, but, 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 but you jewelry. would be losing money initially to sell it higher. Wouldn't it wouldn't no. work in capital. So no, no, it no. It does no. not have value because jewelry, uh, because jewelry is the demand. Jewelry no. has value because it has gold. Exactly. Yes, this, that, 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 this, is, that is true because, technology because technology. Yeah, for the same reason, that people believe that this was a special metal. Okay, that they believe it because through a Darwinian way they would yes. exchange different they, things. They, no, things no, 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 no. There, 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 there are other metals that have the same, common, exactly the same characteristics. No, it's not, not true. No, this true. is that's, true. This is not true. <laughs> this is, this is physics. This yeah. is not economics. No, no, no. That's not you physics. Can't just say things that are not true. Like in no, physics, no. The crust of the buns is a gold. Well understood. No, no. And the uh, mortality of gold is well understood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But if you have platinum, you have you have a platinum number of more abundant than gold. Yes. It's, it's 0.05 uh, today, today, the, and it's are, never achieved the same social. There, are, there are studies that show. It's uh, also that, uh, indiscernible from, from okay. silver and palladium. I have but, seen I have seen some, some studies uh, today that show the, the the quantity of gold could increase dramatically if the price increased dramatically. They're wrong. They're wrong. Oh it's well. A function of it's math. Okay. That, that, that's not. Uh, <laughs> When has, the, when has the supply of gold ever increased by more than 1% a year? When America was discovered more than 1% a year? That, that, that's, that's not, it's actually not true. So I'm a mining engineer, I study geology, I study physics, and I'm just, I want to explain it because this is knowledge, that this is the problem. And, and I had a, you know, I, I had a, a European Central Banker come up to me before and say, you know, I have my beliefs about gold. And I said, that's fine, there's a $7 trillion market gives its beliefs right back every day. It's a market. You, it, so, so, but, but if you look at what the, the crustable abundance of gold, you look at it on a scale of, of grades, and it, it's a very linear, the same amount of energy, even in, in, in Latin America, sure, every once in a while you'll find a very special deposit. And that will change very, very small, the, the short-term inventory. It doesn't change the money stock at all. The cost of mining it, no matter where it is in the world, is basically the same. Because it's so dense, it's just the cost of energy. That's almost, almost all the cost of energy. And so it doesn't matter if you find more gold, unless it's way better grades. But we know the geology of the Earth, and that, that those outliers don't exist uh, in, in the way that would change the money stock. I mean, this, this is information that just is not known. No, look, uh, I, I, I would uh, tell you the following, I'm not just uh, shooting from the hip. I, I am uh, basically I am the board of a company that has three uh, gold mines. In fact, it's not convenient for, my, for us to say what I'm saying. Um, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is that even the production and the production function, one in Ecuador, one in Australia, two in Chile, whether we even production the production function uh, is totally similar to the extraction of copper. It's totally similar. Yeah, it's, it's an input of energy, labor, and time, but the copper decays. It has a half-life. The gold yeah. doesn't. Yeah. And, 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 and again, I, I mean, you can reference the studies. I work for a mining company. My degree's like, I'm telling you, this is the math. This isn't opinion. This is the math. Well, okay, moreover, uh, one last thing I'll mention Hello? is I, I've actually I ranked... I think we're getting into a circular argument, and I think other people have questions no, to ask. Okay. I'm Dr. Holsebosch from Houston, Texas, and I teach medical school. And I've watched Facebook as a very poor business model, and as an investor, I wouldn't go into Facebook. Now, as your business model, I see several flaws, it, at least from my point of view, and one of them is Brinks is your partner, is warehousing your basis for your product. And I don't understand why they're going to warehouse for free. 
I don't, at 1% transaction cost. We pay for input fees. We're not well, passing right. that fee on to you. I understand. Right now, it's a stable number. What's to prevent Brinks from saying, aha, I should increase my storage fee as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger? So, so that's actually a really good question. Um, and this goes back to the physics. So why does gold make sense as money versus, say, copper? Remember what we just said, uh, as, as Dr. Blaher said, the cost of mining copper is the same as mining gold. And what we say is the cost of mining anything is the same as mining gold. But, but because of the crustal abundance, because of the relationship between gold and copper, so for every one unit of energy, labor, and time, you get one unit of this, you'll get 5,000 times copper. Do you understand that? So, if, so okay, so what, is, so what does that mean? That means the price of copper per space is much lower. In other words, in other words, gold has a higher ratio of value per space. This is five hundred dollars of gold. You know, Brinks is going to figure that out and charge you. No, 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 no. So, 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 let me explain. You're not listening. Um, this little cube of ten grams represents five hundred dollars of gold. If I was to have five hundred dollars of copper, it would be about this size, five thousand times the size. Now, where does this goes back to the storage? To store this and protect this and guard this costs less in physical space, less warehouse space, less guards, less insurance than storing copper. And as a result, the price to store copper is about half a percent a year versus gold, which we pay a very insignificant amount of basis points. In fact, it's cheaper, as Stanley Drunkenmiller just said, and Ray Dalio, who we, who we met yesterday, said it's cheaper to store gold than it is to buy more most negative yielding well, government bonds. Well, the issue bonds. is now. But when Brinks sees, whoa. No, but, 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 but Brinks is not in the business of, of raising its prices just because it sees a boom. It's in the business of providing a service at a, at a cost and generating a margin. And the fact of the matter, matter is, storing gold is cheaper than storing copper. And so it'll always be cheaper to store gold than any other commodity. The question is about how you make a profit. I guess you take some fees from the transaction or the store the amount. Uh, you basically offer some uh, banking uh, services or alternative to banking uh, services and you do not make a fractional reserve. To me, that means that you need to make a, take a, a higher fee for me because you don't invest the money for your services. So if you look at something like PayPal, uh, it has $9 billion of actual deposits on the platform. But that $9 billion will spin around 25 times a year. So the transaction velocity on the PayPal network is about a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. As a result, PayPal's very low fees that it charges generates very high EBITDA and operating profit. In fact, PayPal generates around $4 billion a year. Conversely, if you take something like a, a gold ETF, it has $30, $40 billion, right? Four times as much as PayPal, but it charges 0.4% a year and so it actually only makes $120 million a year. So PayPal makes 40 times more money on one third the amount of cost because of the velocity. And so the reason we reduce the price to 1% is because we want you to increase the velocity. We want, it, we want to make it easy for you to transact in gold. And what we've already proven in one year, now our, our business is actually uh, not that complex, it's an internet business. We don't have brick and mortar branches. We don't have high capex. We're actually just a, a, an office in Toronto with 32 employees. And those 32 employees service 1 million people and $2 billion and about $2 million a day of velocity. In other words, we're already at the state. Now our costs are fixed. So as long as we produce enough revenue to cover our fixed costs, everything else is gravy from that point forward. And so as a business model, we want to incentivize usage of the platform, adoption of the platform, by making gold as inexpensive to use as any fiat currency or PayPal. My question is uh, it's not about gold. It's, uh, it's a question to Professor Blecher. Um, you said that uh, because of the low interest, uh, central banks have a uh, have, has some something to do with the redistribution of, of, of income. They, they, they are playing a role that they, sh they shouldn't be playing. It. They, they are they're playing a role of distribution of income. And I, I don't completely understand it. It's really a clarifying question. Uh, because on one side, I understand that pension funds 
uh, who, who depend on interest rate um, imply that people who have a probably lower income and the pension is a, a very sizable part of their investment portfolio would have low income but also uh, wealthier people who have um, uh, stocks uh, or have uh, other kind of, uh, of, of financial assets who, that also see their the revenue the the yield on, on the assets all very are very low too so um, on both sides I see a decrease on on income so why what, what does it mean redistribution of income when when to, all of them are are punished by a low interest yeah, that, that is a uh, that is um, empirical question. Uh, okay. But in fact, when lower interest rate rates tend to, to increase the result, uh, the return on, on, on uh, equity, for example, on, on stocks, mm -hmm. and reduce the, the interest on fixed income, uh, reduce the, the income from a fixed income. Uh, I didn't say I didn't mean to say that uh, they are playing a role they shouldn't play. They say that they are they are playing a role that requires some democratic balance to make this decision. Uh, from, from, from the point, of course, the answer is, OK, inflation also has redistribution effects. And if you don't do anything, you will have this effect. But it's a, it's a sort of an empirical, uh, an empirical question. Uh, the, the evidence is that uh, it tends to show that the uh, income distribution is, is being affected by central banks for, uh, strongly. How do you plan to work with the international market right now? And the second one is your policy with the currency has changed during these years after the um, 2008 uh, crisis. I, I think that there is one uh, very clear uh, trend at, the, the, uh, at this moment. And this moment is um, there is a trend toward uh, over-regulation in the market. Markets are over, uh, are over regulated, are apparently over regulated. Uh, uh, however, at the same time, this huge amount of liquidity is creating again bubbles. Uh, the same type of, uh, uh, or bubbles are different, difficult to define because uh, in, you don't know if it's a bubble until they explode. But uh, basically, they apparently, uh, there are apparent distortions in the, in the price of assets, and. Uh, Maybe the, the gold issue is, is also being affected by, I, 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 I wouldn't say, but it's possible that the, also there are distortions in the, the relative price of commodities. And the, so I would say, think that the, the, it's difficult to say that the crisis is completely over. In, in Europe, it's not over at all. And may, there are many countries which have not gone back to the level of output they have before the crisis. And the, the issue of um, uh, over-regulation of the financial market is uh, creating a lot of uh, new distortions and new, uh, and, and new potential risks. Uh, regarding the, the exchange rate, uh, the exchange market, the exchange rate market, I mean the foreign exchange, uh, well, the, the one thing that they did not happen after the, after the crisis is uh, more cooperation between countries. This is up, uh, in terms of policy, the uh, policy implementation. Uh, the, again, the observation is that uh, the countries continue to uh, ignore, large countries continue to ignore uh, at all the, the, the spillovers or the, their own policies. So um, they, there is more room apparently to, uh, to coordinate policies. Uh, uh, it has been one observation, I'm going to finish with it, one real clear observation uh, is that um, quantitative easing does not seem to work very much, and this is a huge amount of liquidity, does not seem to work very, very, uh, very efficiently, except through one channel, which is the exchange rate. When the Americans decide not to change, not to change the, the, the interest rate or, or to change the interest rate, the effect has been through interest rate, through, through exchange rate. Has been and only very recently they are starting to take into consideration what happened. But as a consequence of that, uh, is one, one, one thing we have observed is these famous currency wars. The, 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 the countries try to develop a policy of, the, of the debasing their, their, own, their own currency to compete. And therefore, uh, this, um, this need, will need to have some, some response. Otherwise, it could, in a situation, in an extreme situation, 
Uh, and then I do believe that the gold market may play, play a role. On this, they may, they may play a role in, uh, as, as an anchor. But why gold and not copper? Why not oil? Because why not people, clothes? Because people believe. Do you really think it's just because people believe? Yes, but but that's but, but you think it's a coincidence then that you can't store copper and you can't store oil and you can't store clothes? You, you can store many things. Depends what, what you, you can't do it. It's physics. It's oxygen. You can't do it. Oil evaporates. You can't store it. So you can't repurpose it. So that, that I would say, you say that, uh, that money is time, and time is finite. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to close. Thank you very much.